Welcome to Good News Rhode Island, the show about Rhode Island and the people and places and events that build our communities, that make Rhode Island a great place to live. Today we're going to be talking with someone who works year-round uh, to make sure that we're all thinking well and we're all learning and we all have a place to meet and gather. And that's Christina Belvalacqua, who's here from the Providence Athenaeum. The Providence Athenaeum is on Benefit Street, and it's open to everyone. It is a membership library, but we'll talk about all that in a minute. But welcome, Christina. Thank you. And I'm so glad you're here, and I'm so glad you're doing salons and uh, evenings on Friday evenings that help people to get together. So thank you. Thank you very much. I'm delighted to be here. Um, I wanted to ask you first about you, and I know people don't necessarily like to talk about that, but this is a very interesting job you have. Um, you have the job of reading books and of meeting interesting people and asking them to speak. What can be bad about that? So could you please tell us a little bit about you? Sounds a little like your job. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, uh, ha I always say don't try this at home when I describe my career because I've done a lot of different things. Um, I got an undergraduate degree in literature from Bard College, um, so I do recommend that people do that still. Um, and then I worked in the publishing industry in New York. I went to graduate school for social work at the University of Chicago and had a lot of interesting experiences after that. I was a hat designer for eight years, which is where I learned <laughs> to make miniature scones that we still have at our salons uh, at the Athenaeum. Um, and I've worked in um, shelters for women, um, domestic violence and otherwise. Um, I've uh, worked in retail. Um, I've done development right. work, grant writing, all kinds of things. So um, the Athenaeum I ended up at after um, three years doing the programs at Leadership Rhode Island, which was a fantastic experience because it gave me an incredible Rolodex of amazing people in all different areas in the state. Um, and. Uh, then worked um, briefly at Family Service of Rhode Island doing a little bit of grant writing. And when the Athenaeum job opened, it was one that I had wanted for years and years. And I was thrilled to be able to join the staff there. So what you're saying is to all those people who aren't finding their exact job right now, the job they always dreamed of, keep working and it will happen. What an amazing career path. You should write about that. I know. Well, I, you know, I, I actually am meeting with somebody this week who's interested in going into a field and is interested in what I think. And I mean, maybe it's different nowadays. You know, I've been in the job market for a long time. But um, I think that I think the best thing is to try different things because you learn what you love and you learn what you don't want and you sort of hone a path for yourself. And um, I was. I guess kind of adventurous. Um, it was c more common, I think, when I was getting out of college in the 19, late 1970s, um, early 1980s. Um, but I've, I'm thrilled to be where I am, and a little bit of everything that I've done um, is in my work now, for sure. That's, we, we all carry all of our past mm -hmm. experiences. Mm -hmm. uh, that's really neat. Thank you for telling us about that. And now you're at the Athenaeum, and some people probably don't even know what it is, let alone that it's on Benefit Street. So um, maybe you could tell us all here in Rhode Island how the Athenaeum could be part of their lives, too. 
Well, and we're very lucky in Rhode Island because we have two Athenaeums, because there's also the Redwood Library and Athenaeum in Newport. Um, we, both libraries come out of the um, period before there were public libraries. Um, the Athenaeum in Providence, we got our original start. We say it's our progenitor library in 1753 when the Providence Library Company was formed. Um, Newport's was just a couple of years before us um, in uh, the same time period. And at that time, it was mostly the learned men of the community who pooled their resources to be able to collect a better library than any of them would have been able to have on his own. Um, that library. But they all had their own libraries, I bet. Well, they did, but you know, it was very expensive to buy books then because publishing here in this country was not really established yet. So to go to, you had to go to Britain really to get books. So it's from the very beginning, it is a, a very democratic idea to have one center where there are books and knowledge available for a larger pool of people. Now, what happens in Providence is that library um, goes along for a while. We did have a disaster five years after it opened when the library burned down on Christmas Eve, I believe it was, um, in 1758. And of the 350 some books that the library owned at that time, all were lost except the 78 that were checked out. And we still have about 48 of those. We call it our founder's collection. So you can still come see those books at the library. It's very inspiring. Um, what, could you tell me some of the titles? Or? Well, one of the really, what's amazing is um, there were libraries at that time that would just send money to England and get as many books as they could. But the Athenaeum founders wanted that library to really represent the most important knowledge that everyone should have access to from the very beginning. So they had specific lists of books and they wanted them to represent history and science and learning and spiritual tr training and all kinds of things. One of the books that we still have that is very beautiful is called The Universal Penman. And it was created as um, a book so that students could practice penmanship. And they would have, it's beautifully engraved, and there are pages with this gorgeous script. And what they would do is, um, so it has the letters, but it also then will have a sentence with the, you know, to, that students can practice from. And they were always sentences that were from the Bible or some sort of um, uplifting, you know, morally um, good kind of uh, uh, sentence so that as the students were practicing, that would sort of literally find its way into them. And what the library would do is loan it out to um, schools, and they would have it for a month for the students to be able to use it. So we still have that today. So they were very publicly minded. Yes, even then. And then what happens is, you know, we forget, but Rhode Island is really the center of um, the Industrial Revolution. And so as the second half of, as the 19th century, as we turn into the 19th century, Providence is increasing in its um, population just astronomically. Um, it's, it, it increases very, very rapidly. And by the um, 1820s, um, there are, there are a lot of self-made men around um, who have become wealthy in industry. And they begin um, talking about a library for um, a, a newer generation, I guess you would say. So in 1831, they do start a library that is called, this is where it gets confusing, it's called the Providence Athenaeum. Um, and for a while, the two libraries coexist. But the Providence Library Company, a lot of the collection has dissipated. It's sort of fallen on hard times. So those libraries try to merge. They can't figure out a way to do that. In 1836, they both dissolve and reform, putting both collections together. And that's the iteration that we are today. Um, it takes two years to build the building. Um, but we've been open on Benefit Street since July 11th, 1838, um, wow. doing the same thing day after day after day. So. so really a public servant in a lot of ways, and yes. yet uh, a center for learning as well. Yes, and I assume students use the Athenaeum quite a bit. We have a lot of students, especially since we got Wi-Fi. Um, a lot of RISD students in particular, but Brown and students from Johnson & Wales all over the place. We have high school members, a few of those. Obviously, um, kids who've grown up there like to come and study. Um, and I think uh, it was one of the things that's very uh, stirring to read is when the Athenaeum opened in 1838, Francis Wayland, who was the president of Brown University and an education reformer, gave a wonderful speech and talked about how essential it was in a democracy to have 
learning available to every citizen because he said, if you live in a monarchy and you end up with a terrible leader, it's a, it's a tragedy, but it's not your fault. But in a democracy, if you have an uninformed citizenry and you end up with a terrible leader, it means that you failed you know, you have not provided your citizens with what they needed to get the best leadership they could. So there was this very strong association with um, the importance of citizens having access to the most important um, learning available in the world. And of course, in the 19th century, it's a period of um, great uh, travel and exploration of a lot of places, and also. Um, revolutions in printing, so it's it's easier to create books and, and also travel, so books can get around more easily. So they were very forward thinking in, in what they brought in and what they made available to the citizens of Providence. So democracy and education were linked in yes, a very clear way, which absolutely. is very interesting. Now, um, the philosophy of, the, of or the mission of the Athenaeum is to sort of bring learning to everyone. So you have a children's section as well that seems to be growing. It's our, we've, we were one of the first libraries to think it was important to collect for children. So one of our really beautiful um, old collections is um, 19th and early 20th century children's literature, which you can go and see. It's, in fact, we have an exhibit up right now. Um, it's called the Old Juveniles Collection. But we collect, I mean, we buy constantly. We have so much children's programming. Our children's librarians are incredible. There are book clubs, movies. There are always animals coming to visit, um, classes on how to, you know, ways to learn things, um, gathering story hours from I swear there are people who have a baby and stop on the way home at the Athenaeum because we have... To make sure they're enrolled. <laughs> well, yes, we have programs for really tiny, tiny children so that they can do, you know, their moms have an opportunity to do singing and clapping and, and just very simple kinds of things. But children learn to absolutely love the Athenaeum. There's a little boy who is a member now who recently said to his mother as they were walking in, this is kind of our second home. And of course, you know, as, as people who work in a library, we love to hear that in the next generation, so yeah. And it's a place to go and study. Yes. Um, you have book clubs for adults, and you we have do. other kinds of discussion groups and seminars? We have, um, we have a, a whole variety of things. As I said, the Children's Library does tons of programming. I know more about the adult programs because that's what I do. Um, we have book clubs. Um, there are writing clubs and reading clubs that meet at the Athenaeum. One is a historical fiction writing club that meets between the Athenaeum and the Providence Public Library and obviously can avail themselves of the special collections in both of those places, which is great for historical fiction writers. Um, we have a Proust reading group, which I run, which we've done for the last, we're in our second group of reading the book over a three-year period. Uh, Baudelaire and Balzac, um, we had a Victorian reading book group last year that turned into a Tolstoy reading group this year. Um, and so there are lots of, uh, lots of bookish things you can do there. We also have regular programming with um, Rhode Island Public Radio, a series called Policy and Pino, where they bring in um, their reporters and fantastic panels um, to look at critical issues of the day in healthcare, education, the arts, politics, a great deal. We usually do three of those a year. We also program regularly with Common Cause once or twice a year um, to look at some of the issues that they focus on. Um, we collaborate with, we've collaborated in the last seven years with over a hundred different community organizations. Um, in our programming. It's very, very collaborative and often bringing not just one group in, but two or three different groups that might have similar things going on that they can connect in a program at the Athenaeum. And one finds about, out about all of this on your web page, is that right? On our website, and, and we also have e-news, yes. Uh -huh. And anyone, we have, we have about 1,000 members at the Athenaeum, but our e-news goes out to about 2,500 people, and you can sign up for it on the front first page of our website. So it's a great way to find out our next two weeks of programs, but we also list a curated collection of all kinds of other things going on around the state. Um, I see that as a public service. Yeah, um, it's I, people amazing love to that. read that and to see how much is going on in Rhode Island. That's the that's the reaction that I love because we didn't start it for that reason. But what so many people say is, even if I can't go to anything that week, it makes me feel great that I live in a city where I could do all of these interesting things. So yeah, I think people really enjoy that. And that's just at what is the email address? Um, the the website is uh, providenceathenaeum.org. 
Um, and then right on that home page, you can just sign up, give us your email address, and you'll get that e-news. It comes out every Wednesday during our program season. You're watching Good News Rhode Island, and I'm here with Christina Bevilacqua, who's here from Providence Athenaeum, one of the oldest libraries in the country. So thanks for being here. Um, so when you came, there weren't salons, and salons are groups of people who meet on Friday night. And maybe you could talk a little bit about that because it's, it's a long, it, it's a great program because it has food and interesting yeah. things. To so <laughs> yes, it's, it, maybe yes, you could talk about it. It's how you get all your sustenance. <laughs> well, um, the interesting thing is, I love it when people say to me, so the salons have been going on since the 19th century, and I say, well, actually, since 2006. But in a way, they're right, because there were salons on Benefit Street in the 19th century, and that was one of the reasons that I sort of went back to that model um, as a way to bring people in. What the salons, we, we do programs outside of the salons, but the salon is the idea of a salon, and they started probably in the 17th century, um, and we're now doing a series called The Cosmology of Conversation, looking at the history of them in different countries, different time periods. Um, it's a very simple idea. It's people that regularly gather, whether there have been people who've had salons every day. Now that, I think, would be a little much for me, but once a week Gertrude is, Stein, maybe. <laughs> yes, and, and some, uh, quite a few, actually. Or, they, or there were women in France who would have three different salons in a week. Um, I do have to actually do other things in my job besides the salon, so I can't keep up that activity level. But we do it once a week. So every Friday night, while we're in our program season, which is the last Saturday in September through, sorry, last Friday in September through first Friday in December, and then first Friday in February through last Friday in May. Um, five to seven every week. You don't have to sign up. You don't have to. Um, get there on time. You don't have to stay for the whole thing. You can drop in, drop out. 5 to 5.30, we have hors d'oeuvres and uh, wine and sherry in tiny sherry glasses. Um, and it's conversational. There's a half an hour of just kind of mingling, seeing your friends, meeting new friends. Occasionally, we'll have an exhibit that people can look at that's connected to the salon. And then at about 5.30, everybody gathers. I ring a bell to get attention, because by that time, there's a great buzz of conversation. And each week we have a different guest. Um, the setup is very informal. It's cafe tables throughout the room, um, chairs wherever we can fit them. Um, and people sometimes sit with their friends, sometimes sit with people they haven't met and become good friends. We've had romances bloom because of the salons. Uh -huh. um, <laughs> and, uh, and then there are presenters on all kinds of topics, um, everything from collecting silver to tap dancing to um, the history of salons, um, writers, dancers, uh, performers of all sorts, theater directors, historians, um, professors, non-academics. It's a real mix. Um, and I think there are definitely people who come week to week because it's something that they're interested in. But I often have people come in and say, who's the presenter tonight? Because they don't come based on what the program is. They come based on what that whole experience is. So it's been very successful. I want you to read a quote that you found from 1728, yes. um, which describes uh, the, the importance of conversation. So, and I'm reading this without my glasses, but this was from Pierre Richelet's um, Dictionary of the French Language, Ancient and Modern from 1728. Conversation should be loved. It constitutes good society. Friendships are formed and preserved through it. Conversation brings natural talents into play and polishes them. It purifies and sets the mind to rights and constitutes the great book of the world. You can see why I loved that quote. Yes, it's <laughs> exactly what you do. So congratulations for finding Thank the you. quote to fit you. Um, so do you want to talk a little bit about this year's uh, salons and what you'll be talking what you'll be talking about talking yeah. well the, conversation yes the con the cosmology of conversation series is one that I'm really excited about and it kind of came up the salons have been going on for almost eight years um, and before I started them I started at the Athenaeum in July of 2005, in fact, on July 11th, which is the anniversary of the day that the library opened, which was just a coincidence. But um, <laughs> I had, the day before, been in New York at a show on Jewish women in their salons throughout the centuries that was a fantastic show. And at that time, 
And still, I mean, one of the issues in nonprofit and one of the issues with the Athenaeum is financial. You know, we don't have a lot of money. We don't have, we have to be very resourceful with what we have. And as I looked at the situation, um, we wanted to increase the number of people coming in. We wanted to increase membership. We wanted to give people exciting things to think about and talk about. And the beauty of a salon is it's really just the idea of people coming together to talk, but doing it on a regular basis. And so one of the other things I thought about was um, there are so many things going on in Providence on a given night. There are excellent things in music, theater, dance, anything you want to do. So I had to create something that was not just about whoever the presenter was. It had to be the whole experience. And we wanted to kind of brand an Athenaeum experience. And again, because salons are a 19th century tradition. It was sort of a perfect match. So um, we, we've had these conversations going on for almost eight years. But I realized last year that we'd never really talked about what is a salon and what are the, you know, why did they come up in the places and times that they did. And I had done a lot of that reading, but I'd never sort of shared it with the rest of the group. So I thought it would be a great way, now that we really have traction as a salon that has gone on for year after year, week after week, to think about ourselves in the larger salon context of the world. So we started out with uh, Madame Recamier in the 19th century, a wonderful uh, professor at RISD named Daniel Harkett did a great talk on her salon. And he talked about how at that period, just after the revolution, France is going through so much turmoil and tumult politically because the government keeps changing that there are a lot that, that and I had never thought about this, but think about what your social life would be like if you had managed to keep your head mm. um, in the first place. You probably had friends whose family members didn't. Um, there were power shifts going on all the time. How do you kind of have a sense of um, security and familiarity? And one of the things that the salon did was create a space where people could kind of be themselves. And um, it, it kind of ameliorated some of those really huge difficulties that were going on in the larger society. It was society. a safe space, I would imagine. Yes. Yeah. And there was a real effort to be civil with one another. And I think that that same need, we obviously didn't just have a revolution, but what we have is a world in which it's very easy to go through your life and never really deal directly one-on-one -on -one with somebody else. You can sort of outsource or you know, do everything electronically. And so if you think about the conversations that take place online, and I'm not really a Luddite. I mean, I, I love technology for some things. But I think that when it takes over one-to-one, -one, there's something that's missing. And I think Part of that is civility and the ability to actually be in a room in a conversation with somebody that you don't agree with, but that you don't immediately uh, resort to invective or insult or whatever. If you come week after week and you meet people in a room together, you have to figure out a way to be able to come back. So you have to be careful when you disagree to do it in an agreeable way. And I think that's, you know, it does. Um, salon culture models a kind of ideal of democratic interaction and, and gives people a sense of agency as well because you do have a place in that room. It matters if you're not there. I always say, you know, an online, um, an online site can wait till somebody wakes up in the middle of the night and goes on and puts on a, a, a comment. But if I had a salon and nobody came, it wouldn't matter how fabulous the speaker was. If nobody's there, there is no conversation. So it really gives people a sense of, I need to participate in this. And I think that's really important. And we talk about the immediacy of uh, online learning or the immediacy of, of using email. But in actuality, sitting across from someone and speaking with them is much more immediate and more intimate. Yes, and there's, a, there's communication that happens beyond just what's, what the words are. You know, there's a. And I think um, there is a lot of evidence of, of kids now going to college, particularly where the colleges are having to sort of create ways for kids to learn how to interact face to face because they're very used to this. Mm -hmm. They're very used to the screen and that kind of distance. But um, to read social cues, to have a sense of somebody could, you know, somebody can say words that can mean 50 different things depending on the facial expression, the body posture, the way they say it. Um, so, so it's, I think, 
we've had two of the Cosmology of Conversation um, salons so far. We have three more coming up. Um, the one this week was a woman named Ann Lynch Boda who got her start in Providence um, doing a salon on Benefit Street. She loved to read at the Athenaeum. We had the books out that she had checked out when she oh, lived wow. here. <laughs> and then she went on to live in New York City and for over 40 years had a salon where world famous people including Oscar Wilde uh, came through. She's the person who introduced Edgar Allan Poe to his Providence fiance for a brief period, Sarah Helen Whitman. And, um, it was interesting to see what she had read when she was at the Athenaeum as a young woman because she was reading about things going on all over the world. She was reading about uh, uh, de Tocqueville's um, democracy in America. She was a deep thinker, and her reading clearly helped lead her to a wider world, and she was very successful at that. You've been very successful at, well as well at what you do. Um, you just received a really wonderful award. Would you tell us about that? <laughs> I did. It was. It, it's a great honor. Um, the Rhode Island Council for the Humanities has an award, the Tom Roberts Award um, for Creative Achievement in the Humanities. I think, and it was. I, I mean, it was given to me, but I, it, it really is. It, it honors the salons in particular. Um, and as I said, you know, if it were just me, the salon would not be the salon. So I'm very happy to kind of organize it every week, but I think it speaks a great deal about the Providence public and people from the rest of the state um, who come week to week and have that conversation. So you would like to welcome people from all over the state. Absolutely. And getting a membership is not difficult. It's very easy. You just go on our website and get a membership. And we have, um, and I should stipulate that um, we are free and open to the public. Anyone can come into the library for the programs. Um, they can come and use the collections, um, read, uh, use Wi-Fi. If you want to check out books, you have to be a member. Um, and members really are the stewards of this organization. And a lot of what we um, get by on today is based on the stewardship of people in the 19th and 20th centuries who made it their business to be sure that this place would continue. So membership is incredibly important to us, but it is not a members only um, organization. So on our website, on the very first page, you see membership. You can just go to that page. We have different levels. There are student memberships. There's a trial membership that's six months that gives you an idea of if it fits into your life and if you like it. But also just stop by for a visit and see. Yes, stop by. That's the big thing. And and if you see Christina, please say hello to her. Yes, Thank please. you for coming. I see you as a counter-revolution in the, <laughs> in the Moog world. Although I certainly believe in online education, I also think that what you're doing in the salon is very, very important, historic, and for the future. So thank you very much. Thank you so thank much. You, it was a Bel wonderful Bel opportunity. Bel we know that you will help to make good news right around the corner from where you live, and we hope that you have a good week. Thank you for watching Good News Red Island.